All right. Another day, another episode of the Victory Degree Podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I am excited for this one because I have a very special guest with me. His name is Dan Jansen. He is an Olympic speed skater, gold medalist, and now he is spending some time with us today. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. So I was doing some research on you, and you're the youngest of nine children. You grew up in Wisconsin. And just for the audience and for myself, when you think back to your childhood, what do we need to know about your childhood that would help us understand who you are as a person today? I would say you probably hit on it already. Just being the youngest in nine um, was, you know, kind of molded me. It made me who I am. I, I um, in a lot of ways, you know, um, in some ways it's easy because you know, you've got so many examples ahead of, you know, older than you and kind of raising you. Um, in some ways it's, and of course they all think you're spoiled, <laughs> but uh, in some ways it's not so easy. Um, you know, rarely getting anything new, always hand me down, those kinds of things. But, um, but more importantly, it just molded me as a person. I learned, I think I, I, I took different personality traits from, a lot of a lot of my siblings you know and my parents as well but um, learned a lot of lessons from older brothers older sisters so it's it's nice when you have a, a large pool to learn from what are some of those lessons that that you took with you as you went on this journey of life <clears throat> you know I would say <laughs> in different ways you know I've got uh, my oldest sister was tremendous athlete and um she just always she always uh competed you know super competitive but did it with kind of class and dignity and um you know my uh my brother told me one time we were i was probably 10 you know and playing basketball in the backyard and you know i always thought i could do things as well as they could. And, and a lot of times I could, um, which I think helped me athletically um, and mentally. But then my brother one time, you know, I said something about, oh, I, I'm good or I can do this. And he he taught me what conceited meant. And he said, you know, you shouldn't say that you're great or good. And uh, from that point on, I, you know, never said it again about myself. I, if I could believe it inside, but I never, uh, I never was outspoken about it how I felt about my talent. And so I guess uh, humility, you know, I was, uh, I tried to be humble and, you know, different lessons like that from a lot of my different siblings and uh, my parents as well. I remember one time my dad, uh, again, I was a kid, but my dad liked to play a golf and watch golf. And we were watching, I think it was, <clears throat> it was a British open. I think Tom Watson beat Jack Nicholas and, uh, they were came down to the last hole and, and my dad said to him, watch watch mr nicholas and uh, and he you know he got beat and he went up and he shook his hand and he put his arm around tom watson and they walked off the green like best friends and, and my dad said you know it's, it's you don't know if 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 he won or lost and he said it'd be it'd be nice you know as you get older and compete if uh, if you could say that when you walk off the ice you talked about humility um, as one of the lessons that you took away from your siblings. <clears throat> there seems to be a fine line between confidence and cockiness. Um, you know, having the confidence to go out, believe in yourself and, and do what you say you're going to do. And then cockiness to, you know, you kind of mentioned it earlier to the point where, you know, it's like, hey, slow down. You're not as good as maybe you think you are. So, yeah. Obviously, we'll get into your career and, and you know, kind of all the all the defining moments. But as you look back, how did you how did you manage that fine line between being a little too cocky or maybe not being confident enough? Um, you know, I. I, uh, I don't know that I had to manage it. For me, it, it you know, I, I say it came naturally, but it didn't. I, I, it came from what, what I talked about, I think, from my my family um, and. I always, 
you know, and, and it also comes from watching others and watching what you like and don't like when when other people before you, not necessarily in my sport, in any sport, if they're being interviewed and they're brash and cocky and loud, it just turned me off. And so from that, I knew I never wanted to be that way. And so, you know, I think I think that's a big part of it, too. I, um, as you brought the subject up, I, I looked up. Because I took a screenshot of this literally about two days ago, just out of coincidence. Um, but it's a, a saying that I, I thought was pretty good, which is why I saved it. It says, confidence is based on evidence. Arrogance is based on insecurity. Confidence is quiet. Arrogance is loud. And I think that's a... That, oh, no, I lost you a second. I think that's a pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good saying and a pretty good description of the way I tried to you know, deal with media and, and my, you know, my own personal side of things. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic quote. I heard um, somebody else say that, um, you know, don't just, you know, don't just shout affirmations at the mirror, build an undeniable stack of proof that you say who you are. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that really stuck with me because it is true, right? At the end of the day, you are what you do. And, um, you know, Go in, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it through your own career, but I wanted to go back to, you know, you talked about looking up to other people and, and watching other athletes. When you were growing up, was there a specific athlete or maybe a role model that, you know, you looked, you looked up to and you said, wow, I want to be like that when I grow up? Well, so, so the one I kind of mentioned already in Jack Nicholas, because of, you know, because my dad pointed that out to me. Um, also though, you know, in my sport, Eric Hyden was, uh, the god he was you know he was and probably t still is the the best who's ever done it and i and i say that of course my times were beating his and stuff by the time i retired but that's times are irrelevant it's it's what he did you know the guy he was sprint champion all around champion he won all five distances in in the 1980 olympics and from 500 meters to 10,000 meters like it'll never be done again uh, we have a phenom right now by the name of Jordan Stoltz, who's uh, he's only 19. He's world champ already, and he can win the 500 up to 1,500, but 5 and 10K, forget it. I mean, it's what Eric Hyden did is, you know, I think the greatest Olympic accomplishment ever, and that includes Michael Phelps' his eight gold medals, you know, four of which were relays, I think. Um, so it's... Or maybe three. I mean, taking nothing away from Michael Phelps. I don't, please don't take it that way. Um, I'm saying individual performance at an Olympic Games. And, um, you know, and so Eric was in my sport, and I got to watch him growing up. And now he's a great friend. I just saw him last week. But um, it was kind of cool having uh, somebody who was that good at something. You know, he's the reason why I wanted to go to the Olympics, really. I was pretty good at other sports growing up and started to get good at skating and by the time I was 14 I watched him in 1980 and that's when I knew I wanted to go to the Olympics. So growing up in Wisconsin um, I have never been to Wisconsin but I can imagine during the winter time probably not too much to do outside. Um, so you somehow stumbled your way into speed skating. I read a story online that and I, I want you to confirm if it's true or not, um, that your parents took you and your siblings to speed skating activities because they couldn't afford babysitters. Is that, is I mean, that true? <laughs> for me, that's pretty much why, it was. like, you know, my dad was a cop, my mom was a nurse and I was number nine. So by the time I came along, yeah, I mean, they, <laughs> they weren't making any money and, uh, but we never knew it, you know? And so, yeah, for me, it was like, yeah, he's, you know, he's four, but we're not going to get a sitter. Just take him along. And, um, yeah, and they got me a pair of skates and off I went. So it's, um, that is maybe a slight stretch of the truth. I mean, it didn't happen always, but that's why, that's a big reason why, um, yeah, why they took me along to the, to the rink at such a young age. So you start speed skating, um, at 16, you set a world record, a junior world record. Was that the moment that, kind of in your mind you're like you know what like maybe maybe i'm kind of good at this whole speed skating thing maybe i should maybe you're already taking it seriously up to that point but maybe after that 
maybe you you told yourself let me let me take it another level yeah it really is i it was my first international race we were in switzerland and um I didn't even know there was a junior world record, but um, they announced it when I finished my race. And not only that, but I finished fourth out of everybody, all the seniors and all the top skaters in the world. So that actually was the race that I uh, thought, you know, I I think I, I might might have a chance to be good at this, yeah. And so after 16, you're like, okay, I could do this. Um, talk to me a little bit about the preparation that goes in to speed skating my experience with speed skating is you know i watch it every time the olympics are on um and it's one of those sports that the athletes make it look so easy on tv right they're they're you know they're skating along and you're like wow i could you know i could probably do this and then you go out to an ice rink and you and you try skating and you're falling down and <laughs> you can't make yeah. a turn and you're like oh, i don't know actually speed skating might be more difficult than i imagined yeah um so what what's the preparation like for speed skating? And then specifically when you were younger, what what what, what did your training look like? Were you out on the ice every single day? Like kind of lead us through that that whole phase of your yeah. life. I mean, so it's a hugely physical sport now. And I say that that's more so when you make the dedication to be be good at it, be to it becomes full time, you know, you then it's training twice a day, you know, it's training basically 10 and a half months to 11 months a year because you, you need a little time off after the season. But, um, yeah, so it's it, it's like um, when I was a kid, even in <laughs> even, I guess, fourth grade, it's not like I was training all day full time yet, but I was already coming off from school going uh our the, the oval was it was the only oval in the united states um where i grew up and a 400 meter oval uh refrigerated oval so um it was two miles from our house and so we would we would jog there every night and i don't you know i i look it wasn't anything for me but i look back and i don't think a lot of fourth graders especially today are coming home from school and going to jog two miles and then skate for two hours so um times have changed a lot in that sense but it was just my life you know and um you know and then back then it was just more skating uh at, at nights and then on the weekends were races and 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 meets throughout the midwest as you get older then it when you make that dedication to turn it into full time then it's um you know all the cross training off seasons weight training inline skating, uh, running, cycling, running hills, um, all kinds of strength and power and speed um, exercises. And then, um, you know, once the fall comes and you're on ice, now they're pretty much on ice most of the year because of the indoor ovals. It's, it's become an indoor sport now, which is kind of sad. But, um, yeah, so then it's skating, you know, you'll skate – once or twice each day and you'll do a, a dry land workout in between so it might be weights it might be a, a bike ride or you know sprints or different things um but it's still a very physical sport and it, it's time consuming and and it's why you know quite honestly it's it's sad but it is the reason that most people uh, are pretty much like you they see us at the olympics and they they love it but they don't really pay attention in the in, in between years and uh you know unless you live in the netherlands or norway um it's just not a not a popular sport and it, it's sad but it's uh man it's it's a great one it's addicting and it's some talented talented people what was your your you know you mentioned being in fourth grade and and going to to training and and doing the workouts and and seemingly being very dedicated to what you were doing um i read stories all the time about athletes you know when they're when they're younger they have this dedication and they might have some factor that motivates them you know for some athletes it might be getting their family out of poverty you know they see sports um as a way to do that and succeeding at the highest level making the, the nfl the nba whatever the case may be so being in fourth grade or let's just say before the age of 16 because i would say 16 is maybe the first time that you saw some level of success 
or at least undeniable proof that, hey, again, I might be good at this. But mm. before then, what, what was your motivation to, to be so dedicated to the sport and to continue training? You know, I was um, even, you know, before then, up until, let's say, freshman in high school, I, I still played other sports. I, I, I played football through my freshman year and then I, then our seasons conflicted. So I had to make a decision played baseball all the way through high school and um it's one of the things i see these days that i think is i think it's a bit sad um parents think that their kids are going to fall behind if they if they play other sports you know and and let's i don't know, pick one you know let's just say they they're basketball players and they don't want them to do anything else in the summertime or in the off season um or they have to do travel ball and it's all year long, like play other sports, do like, you don't have to be the best at them, but the, 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 the lessons you learn from those other sports, the, the coordination skills you get from those other sports, they transfer into the sport you end up in. And those couple years, maybe that they may be, be behind the kid who's doing it all year long at 12 years old. Um, they, they catch up and then they pass them. It happens all the time. And, uh, it's sad. And, and part of it's some of the coaches drive them that way. They think this is the only sport you, you should be doing. And it's just, um, it's kind of sad. So for me, the motivation back to your question was, um, just loving to do something. I loved competing. I loved all sports and, and then the motivation in skating. Yeah, it was, um, you start to see improvement all the time. It's a very, you know, it's an individual sport, obviously. And so I, I love team sports, but I, I gravitated toward the individual side of things because I loved to work on my own. I like, I mean, you know, I trained with others, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I also did a lot on my own and I like to go out and do things by myself and work and push and dream. Um, and you know, so I guess inbred a little bit, but again, it probably goes back to some of the family things and all of that, but you know, who knows what makes us exactly what we are, but, but I always like to do and, uh, and work solo on a lot of things. When did your dream to go to the Olympics start? So my dream, well, let's say, let's call it a dream that that I believe was possible was probably at, at 16, uh, at 14, I, I started to really, because I was good. I like I was national champion at, you know, in my age group at, you know, at 14. So maybe then when I, when I watched Eric Hyden in 1980, um, but I do remember, I remember watching my first Olympics. I remember watching was probably, 1972 I mean I'm seven years old but I I have vivid memories partly because uh, uh, you know this the winter games um, it wasn't televised anywhere near like it is now but but still these these skate speed skaters were in a sport that I did at this at this young age and so of course you know it's a small world so you're gonna hear the names and even know some of them so the you know I guess maybe the dreams started way back then but then the, the the dream of making it a reality, 14 to 16. And so you go to the 1984 Olympics, to your first Olympics. You are, I believe, the youngest skater at that Olympics. It was. Yeah. Um, that was in Yugoslavia, I believe, back in the yeah. back in 84. Um, I mean, you come to the Olympics. It's this event that you've dreamed of since maybe you're seven years old. You've only seen it on TV up to that point. You step into the village or wherever the first place that you go to. What was like your first impression? Like, were you? Did you have to pinch yourself and say, "Dan, like, <laughs> we're here, we made it." I mean, I, sure. I, I imagine it was a surreal moment for you. Yeah, and it even I guess it even starts before then because when you do when you make the team, then you go through what they call processing, and you get all your yeah, uh, you get you know all your ID stuff, but more so you get all the all the gear, all the clothing, and they just load you up with all the stuff. And, and at that age, you're just, wow, this is crazy. All the USA things, everything has USA on it. So so that part 
you know, is at that age and the first time is amazing. And the other thing that really sticks out, the village you mentioned, uh, but opening ceremony was one of the coolest things that I'd ever done at that point. Just just being able to walk into the stadium behind the American flag and with all the U.S. teammates and not just the speed skating teammates. Now it's it's every every team, all the skiers and hockey and figure skating, every sport that's there. And so that part was, uh, you know, just, you know, you felt... Look, I mean, I had been competing for a couple of years by that point with USA on my back and on my uniform, but there's an extra, extra sense of of pride uh, when you compete at the Olympics of, of, you know, of who you were representing. And so what was your mentality going into your first Olympic Games? Was your goal, hey, I'm just going to go out there, compete as hard as I can and let the results kind of play out the way they do? Or mm-hmm. were you, you were gunning for gold right from the start? No, it's pretty much, you know, happy to be there. Uh, but I realistically, I thought, you know, a, a possible top 10 would have been amazing. Uh, I thought, you know, why not? You know, I'm I'm a young kid, but I like I said, I'd done it before in a couple of these international races. I was I was up there with a lot of the guys. So I I wasn't expecting a medal, but I outside dreaming of one, but then more realistically a top eight up top 10 maybe and then yeah I finished fourth I was in third for for a while and then one guy uh one more guy came and beat beat my time but uh it was not at all disappointing at all I was so uh just like I said just happy number one to be there but also uh you know fourth from my perspective, fourth wasn't so bad. You know, it's 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 a lot different the way the press views it sometimes. Um, but at 18, fourth wasn't a bad place to be. Now, four years later, it wasn't as happy of a fourth as, as this one. Yeah, and so after the 84 Olympics, you come back to the States, and I'm assuming you were maybe a little more motivated than you were prior to that, or now at least you were like, okay, I have the first Olympics under my belt. Let me continue training and give, you know, like you just said, let me give the 88 Olympics, um, you know, a better shot. So that period between 84 and 87, what what was your mindset during that time and, and how were you preparing for the 88 Olympics? It was a, I, all I had at that point was just now I'm, now I know I'm there. And so I just was, I loved to train. I loved to keep getting better. And that's all I want to do was get better. So you know, 85 right away the following year. I had injuries. I had a couple pulled hamstrings, and I didn't get to train or compete most of the year the way I wanted, but I got to the World Championships, um, won my first first medal. I got on the podium the first time, um, and silver in the 500, and then bronze overall in the sprint championships. And so uh, right away, now I'm legit now I'm a uh, I'm a medalist and I know I belong there 86 I, I won my first gold medal at the world championships at 20 years old so so now it's like okay here we go you know I'm uh n- now I'm not only one of the hopefuls I'm really one of the guys to beat and that certainly was the case uh going into 88 you talk about you know meddling at, at the world championships and I mean being so young you know people like you just said people for I mean you're 20 years old at the time I mean mm-hmm. you're yeah you know back you know back in my when I was 20 I don't know I was playing call of duty and and <laughs> stressing out about my calc 2 homework <laughs> um right. okay. uh, I was not competing on the world stage so seemingly today when people find any ounce of success in their lives some people tend to slow down or they say, all right, you know, I've made it. It seems like it could have been easy for you after you medaled at the world championships to say, all right, Dan, you know, we're, we're doing it. We're, we're getting some accolades, you know, how about we just like slow down a bit, maybe, you know, not train as hard, but it seems like you had the exact opposite approach. So what, um, why do you think people slow down when they, when they find, a, a, you know, some level of success and, and again, back to the motivation, but what, what kind of kept you, kept you going and training as hard as you did? I think, you know, it's the beauty and the, and the, 
the what do you what's the word like it's what makes the olympics so beautiful and it's what makes the olympics so difficult are the same thing and that they're only once every four years and so um i knew you know i knew we had an olympics coming up and that is is our ultimate dream as as an amateur athlete so um so that really wasn't hard to keep motivated because now i knew i was i was the best in the world i knew that i got a chance for you know for an olympic gold medal or an olympic medal of any kind really but certainly gold um you know the again the tough part of the olympics comes with the other side of my story and that if, if it doesn't happen then you got four more years to wait till another one so then keeping motivated can can be tough and we you know i assume that's still coming in in our in this questioning but um i really can't answer for others in terms of why they yeah tend to i know what you mean and i've seen it uh when you say people reach a certain level and tend to slow down but for me it's always been uh it's always been getting better like it's really don't we all just want to be better tomorrow than we are today and uh, no matter what we do so for me that's always been my mindset so you're training um you're getting you're getting ready for the 88 olympics you you think that um i'm sure that you probably felt like you might have been in the best physical shape up to that point um and you're you're getting ready and something happens in january of 1987 um you find out that your youngest sister, Jane, was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, and then that kind of starts this next chapter of your journey um, and of your uh, you know, your career as a speed skater. So, um, Dan, I'll be honest with you, I can't imagine hearing that news. I have a sister. Um, and, you know, if, if somebody were to call me and say, hey, your sister's diagnosed with leukemia, I don't know what my first thought would be. I don't know what my first action would be. Um, I'd probably sit there and stare up at the ceiling and, and think, where did it all go wrong? So, um, you know, I can't begin to imagine what that must have been like for you. But if you don't mind, you know, lead us through some of the emotions that you felt after hearing the news and then kind of how that impacted you and, and shaped you as a person. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's an odd thing when you hear those words. And I, I remember I just got back home from training that day um i was i was home training in milwaukee um because our uh yeah and anyway and bonnie blair was with me for some reason i don't know why she came back to the house but um i got home and my brother was in the my brother and my dad were in the living room and i could tell something was wrong and there was tears in a couple of their eyes i'm like what's going on and my brother said jane's got leukemia and before, um, so Jane had just given birth to her third child. She was still in the, in the hospital, um, just kind of recovering from that. And they were just doing routine blood tests and they discovered this. And so, uh, you know, she was 26 years old at the time. And, and before, I think most people is probably true for, unless you're studying these things for some reason, but you know, when, when they say a word like that, you don't really know what it means. I knew it was bad. I knew it was cancer, but so I basically said, well, you know, what do we do? What, what, what can we do? And, and my brother, Jim is very blunt. Um, he just says it like it is. And he said, he said, you usually die from leukemia. And I just, it just literally floored me. I just, it just took my breath away. Um, I couldn't fathom this. And and so, you know, then you, you kind of, you go through all these emotions, you put yourself in her shoes, you, you know, you try to come together as a family, you support each other, but, um, but literally there's not, you know, the rest of it's in the doctor's hands, I guess. And, and so it was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's get her the best treatment possible. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a hundred percent a death sentence. We, it's, it's been done before it's been beaten we can do this and you know but so then everything especially for me just sort of um just had a different meaning you know i never i mean to this day it does um but it everything 
has a different perspective. The Olympics were still important, but they they weren't all I thought of every day. They weren't, uh, you know, they just, they didn't lose meaning. But I did fight for a while with, um, you know, and even, even after, even as I would go on the next, you know, until the end of my career, uh, you know, is is it... <laughs> Is it even right to be able to celebrate when things go well or be sad when they don't? Because, you know, Jane's, you know, Jane's going through this battle or Jane lost her battle. You know, but I realize now as a, you know, many years beyond the fact that that's not really for us to decide. It's, there's no right or wrong in how, in, in your, in your celebrations or your mourning or, it, everybody's different and but you certainly shouldn't feel bad about um, about feeling good um, she would never want that you know it's just it's part of life it's it's one of the things my mom was great at just saying look things we can't control sometimes in in life and and you have to, you've got to find ways to deal with them and move on um, that doesn't mean you're not sensitive about it uh, it just means what else can we do? You know, I mean, you can't you can't stay in that position your whole life. You can't stay in that state I was the minute I found out she had leukemia, because what what happens then? Then you're useless to the world and yourself and your family. So you you have to find ways to to keep stepping forward. It's um. I mean, when when things like that happen, things that seemingly feel like they're bigger than life something like you know you mentioned briefly kind of how you viewed speed skating in that moment but something like speed you know speed skating might seem so insignificant in the moment mm -hmm. when you're dealing with your sister being diagnosed with leukemia and so you mentioned your relationship with with speed skating after that a little bit but did you view speed skating as an escape or was it something mm -hmm. that just seemed again insignificant it's like what am I doing? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here training for this, for this event. You know, I... Yeah. It's a good question. I, to answer that one, I would jump ahead actually to 88 when she passed away, on, you know, at the Olympics and, and I went, I, I actually did go through, I didn't, yeah, obviously none of us knew this was going to happen on the same day. And, and coincidentally, what are we, the 16th of February it was, it was two days ago. It was the 14th of February. And, when she passed on that morning, you know, and then subsequently I fell that evening. Um, I didn't, I didn't know what emotions I should, I should have. I didn't know if even like during the day before, she, before the race, I didn't know if are people going to think I'm insensitive. I, if I win, uh, after the race, when I fell, I didn't know if I should be able to be sad about falling. Um, you know, there was no blueprint for this one. This, this really hadn't happened before that I knew of anyway, and nobody to talk to about how I should feel or, and, you know, and so I would say after that, you know, getting kind of to your question about that, I think I spent almost the remainder of that season as an escape. I went, went back home for the funeral came back to the Olympics, watched my teammates, watched Bonnie Blair win, uh, just just kind of lived my, kept living that life. I went back to Europe, finished the World Cup season. I actually won that and but I do feel looking back that 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 last part of the season was sort of an escape because I did not want to go home. I didn't want to sit there and not know what to do with myself and feel sorry for myself and the rest of us. And so at that point, I do think it was sort of an escape. And I just want to go back to the, to the 88 Olympics. Um, you know, mm. you mentioned your sister passing right before your race. Um, I, I hope people realize, but if they don't, I mean, you were, you were one of the top skaters in the world up to that point, And you had a lot of expectations going into the 88 Olympics. We talked about your preparation for those games. Um, but just from a talent level and from the results that you've achieved, that you already achieved on the world stage, again, you were, I don't say you were a favorite, you know, but you were, you're up with the best. And, and again, you had expectations that 
hey, the 88 Olympics might be when when we finally break through and get that medal. And so um, finding out that your sister passed away right before, I want to read you a quote that um, you have you have said in your memoir. Um, you said, I was destined to go down as one of the greatest speed skaters in history, maybe the greatest in the 500 meters. But to millions of other casual fans, I was either a choker, an Olympic klutz, or at best, the all-time heartbreak kid. A lot to unpack, um, but your initial reaction hearing that quote. Yeah, that was, that was I think, before the my final games and um, leading up to the Lillehammer games in 94. Not, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say it uh, applied as much in 88 just yet, but it certainly did going into my last games. Now, getting back to 88, though, so I, I definitely was favored. I won the world championship seven days before this. Um, so I'm going into Calgary as the favorite in the 500 meters at least. Um, but it's an, but that quote is very interesting. I hadn't heard it in a while. I remember it now that you say it. Um, but again, yeah, that applies to my last games, I think. I, I don't know, you know, I, I just, <clears throat> I spent time wondering if I should skate. We talked with the family. Should I even go out and, and do this? But we knew what Jane would have wanted. I think that was the ultimate decision maker. When I was talking to my mom on the phone, and she's like, well, Jane would want you, you know, she'd feel terrible if you didn't go go out and try. And I knew that. But um, look, if I if I had to do it all over again, I would still skate. I would have I would go out there and do the best I could. It just uh another lesson you know in in the mental and physical preparation it takes to get out there and do what we do um i just sort of <laughs> didn't do any of that that day i laid in bed most of the day shedding some tears and wondering you know asking all these questions and then uh went out and tried it but my body was was not my body <laughs> it was just it was not it uh, Strange feeling, physically and mentally, but, uh, you know, when it all un unfolded on the very same day, it was something that I wasn't prepared for. You know, I I guess nobody is, but um, just, you know, there's proof my body couldn't handle it. I think you might have mentioned this um, in a separate interview, but you felt like you're two, there was two worlds colliding, and it was the world of... I should feel really happy on this day. I have, you know, like you said, you were favored to win the gold medal uh, at the 500 meter. So it was potentially one of the happiest, supposed to be one of the happiest days of your life. Yeah. But then that collided with one of the saddest days of your life. And you felt like you couldn't really process how to handle those two worlds colliding. For sure. I mean, it's a, again, I hadn't seen that in a while, but it, I, I, I remember writing that and speaking that and it's, um, it doesn't happen very often if you think about it in your own life. You, you, it's very rare that you have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, or or at least the possibility of the highest of highs. Um, and so, there's a lot of room in between those two things, and you just, it, it's a very difficult spot. And again, at, I guess I was 22 years old at that point, so relatively a kid, you know, and. Um, there's so much about life and about the world you don't know yet. And again, not saying I would do it differently today, but, um, <laughs> but I don't know if the result would be different. You know, I just, uh, who knows? It's, it's, that's why life is just so amazing. It comes and goes in moments. They're here and they're gone. And, uh, and we, you know, we navigate through them. Let's talk about another potentially um, important moment in in your life, at least in my opinion. Uh, you were invited to the White House in 1988. Got a chance to meet with Ronald Reagan. Um, what was what was that experience like? Given again everything that 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 you went through, um, the pain of obviously losing your sister, and then also the pain of just the Olympics. But also, it's it's the White House, it's the president. You know, for many, it would be yeah. such a cool experience. But you know, and 
obviously, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk to it, but I'm sure you probably had a little bit of a different experience, I so should say, I, or at least mindset. Yeah, I remember feeling, you know, it certainly it's an honor to be there and to all that. And the whole team was there. I remember though, specifically feeling awkward, I guess that he, um, in his talk to the whole team, he, he singled me out. And, um, I just felt like, again, I, I didn't know that if I should be, uh, it just wasn't it didn't feel right to me not to, and i'm i'm not saying he was wrong to do it i'm saying for me i wasn't comfortable because i didn't you know i didn't do anything it was just something that happened and um i know people look at it differently and and the people look at it as courageous to get out there and try and i get that and i appreciate that very much but at the time it was it was an uncomfortable moment i remember feeling that um you know, having said that, I have, um, after 94, when I won, I got, I literally right next to me, I have four letters from four presidents. Uh, the top one is from Ronald Reagan, and it's unbelievable. It's one of, it's my favorite letter ever written to me. So, um, you know, again, time, time goes by. But, um, yeah, at that moment, I do remember feeling a bit uncomfortable. So I have part of his quote here, if you don't mind, I'll read, I'll read you part of it. So he said, talking about gold medals, uh, from America's heart, there's one that goes to Dan Jansen for his courage. And one that goes to his family too. their devotion to each other, captured the heart and earned the admiration of our entire land. Dan, you received the United States Olympic committee's Olympic spirit award and everyone here and around the country applauds the committee's choice. You dedicated that honor to your sister, her memory and your entire family. And now you're back in competition and number one in world cup points. Yes, your family is very precious in your life, and if recently a cause of uh, a cause of great sadness is also a source of great strength, and that strength is an inspiration to the entire world. So, that's cool. I yeah, I don't remember those words. That's very cool. Thank you for bringing that back. Now I don't feel so uncomfortable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, was, that was very nice and, and quite well well written on their part. You know. Um, to make it to make it tasteful i guess um that's nice so fast forward to 1994 um it was uh, a year that you finally broke through at the uh, at the olympic games finally winning that coveted gold medal um in the thousand meter race the 500 meter race didn't go um maybe as well as as you would have hoped i believe you mm -hmm. slipped um during that yeah. race but um you we talked about heartbreak kid, um, you know, and, and kind of just not, you know, not living up to what people expected of you, um, obviously with, with many reasons behind it, but 1994 is kind of where it all came together. And I want to bring up two people that, um, you know, from the outside seemed very influential in, in the success that you're able to achieve. So first Peter Mueller, um, who, who coached you up before the 94 games, I believe he himself had won the the thousand meter race in seventy six, maybe or seventy four. Yeah, I'm getting 76. the years mixed up. Seventy six, um, yeah. So what what Peter Mueller? What did he help you with? And what was, you know, what was what was his message to you before before the ninety four games? And so we, I mean, you know, I would have to even go back to to ninety two, um, which is you know another tough one i was that's when i was favored i finished fourth in the 500 and right when we left alberville um you know that we we knew for the first and only time in the history of the olympics that there was going to be another one in two years they winter and summer used to be on the same years and they they wanted to stagger them so this there's another games in 94 and none of us neither of us were sure if if we were done after 92 what we're going to do and as soon as we were leaving Alberville, he he looked and he said, "Hey, if if you're in, I'm in for two more." And uh, I said, "All right, let's do it." So those two years, they were, I mean, it was like I I had zero trouble getting out of bed and motivating. I was every day was fun. People, 
he was fun to train with and work hard for. Um, it was always positive and, you know, and so when we got to, to Lillehammer, I hadn't been beaten all year in the 500 meters. In fact, five of the five fastest times in history were all mine. So the 500 was going to happen and it was going to be gold and, and I slipped in the last turn. And so now it's like, this is impossible. This didn't happen again. Nobody could believe it. And, um, we had the thousand meters left and most people thought, well, the 500 is my race. I have no chance in the thousand, but I felt differently. I'd skated some really good ones. Uh, I won some world cup thousands leading up and, and Pete was the only other one, maybe the only other person that, that really believed, um, that this could happen. And so, you know, he just, he kind of went about it like that, like it's almost, uh, as hard as it was to put that 500 meters behind us, it was like, almost like it didn't happen. Win or lose, it's just, all right, we got a thousand meters to skate here. And, and he really made it feel like a, I should say, he didn't make it feel like, okay, this is your last chance. This is, this is it. He made it just feel like another fun race. We're going to go out and, and win. And, and so, you know, I won't say I stepped to the line knowing I was going to win this thing, but I, I did step to the line with, with, um, with a lot of hope and a lot of belief, you know, and, uh, and more so than I think most people, most other people had. You talk about this belief that you had, um, another influential person during that time for you was Dr. Jim Lair. Uh, who yeah. were, you know, world renowned sports psychologist. I think he was working with a lot of tennis players at the time. Um, but he kind of took you under his wing and what, what did you learn from him? And did that source of belief come from anything that he taught you or was that tied to something else? I think it's a combination, but Jim was a huge part of it. In fact, he was, he was scheduled to fly home after the 500. He figured I was going to win and, um, he was going to go watch the rest of the games at home and, uh, but when I didn't win the 500, he stuck around, he changed his flight and he was there, right? He, you know, maybe even more so than Pete on the, the immediate, uh, time after the 500, he's, he's like, look, I know it hurts, but that race is over. That's done. You have to look forward. There's a thousand meters in three days. And, um, and you know he was he kind of brought back all the all the successes all the positive things that we had gone through the last three years that i was working with him and um and he never ever let me or ever let a negative come in even though there were so many because the the press and the interviews you know i did them once after the 500 and then i said i'll talk to you again after a thousand but um so many of them were negative or, you know, do you feel like a failure? Do you feel blah, blah, blah. And, um, and he was just so staunchly the other way you think about your successes, you think about your favorite here for a reason, because you're the best, you know, all of these, these things. And, and it's, if you, it's not always easy to think that way if you don't have somebody to remind you that, um, and, and he was great. So it was, uh, he was another one that when I finally won that it was, uh, you know, I felt good for so many other people, my family and Peter and, and Dr. Lair, all of those, it was unbelievable. You talk about the, the, you know, seemingly the power of positive thoughts, the power of self-belief. Um, I know now you, you train, um, you know, your personal trainer, you work with, you know, NASCAR drivers, uh, golfers, um, and, and one of the things that you said that you like to teach them is, is visualization mindset. Um, how much of the success that we experience comes back to that self-belief and that ability to visualize what success is for us? I've been reading a ton of, you know, about this recently and, you know, people always say, oh, well just, you know, visualize success, but. I don't really know what that means. And so I was hoping, I know we're jumping around a little bit here, but I was hoping you could 
maybe enlighten me with what does it mean to visualize success and, and what do you teach your clients? Yeah, it's, it's really well put. Um, and, and a great point you make because I've, I've heard speakers, I've heard so-called experts, whatever, just say just what you said, visualize success. Well, um, for me, it's more about, so you, first of all, you have to define success. You have to define what that is for you because, um, you know, in the long run, look, I'll, I'll tell you this. When I, when I went into the thousand meters and partly because of Jim Lair, my goal completely changed. I, my, my goal used to be Olympic gold. I want to win a gold. My goal wasn't that anymore. My goal was, uh, skating to my potential at the Olympic games. I figured, yeah, if I do that, it's good enough to win, but let me change this around. Let him, let me make it less, uh, result oriented. And, and so that's what I would say to you and your question. First of all, what, um, what is your goal? And I would suggest that it's not a result. I, I would suggest it's not first place or whatever. I would suggest it's more something more general, something more like um, happiness or um, like fulfilling potential, those kinds of things. And then, then you, it's easier to visualize. And then, so again, like, yeah, for the drivers I work with, it's hard because some of them are, they range in age, you know, from 20 to upper thirties. But um, so, you know, you say, oh, okay, it's, it's going to be a win and let's visualize it. But it's not so much that it's, it's, let's take it a se an overall season. Let's take it how you, how you went into and came out of races mentally, uh, the things, the decisions you made, you know, were they, were they the best ones you could have made? Did, can you improve on them? And that kind of goes with, with every sport. Um, and so it's, yeah, visualizing it. I still do it. And I still, um, like I'll, I'll have them visualize a golf shot or a, or a race or a, a moment in that race or a decision they have to make just so they can get relaxed. And then if it happens in real time, they feel like they've been there before. And so it's, it becomes natural. Um, but just to say visualize success and it's going to happen, is it's pretty vague. And I, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because it's not, it's not the way that people should just say that, I think, without an explanation. What, what would be, you know, if there's a young athlete listening to this right now and maybe they're going through it, maybe they've failed, what, what, would, what would be like the one piece of advice that you would want to tell them and, and leave them with? Uh, I would say, I would say, you know, I've been through all of it, um, the good, the bad, the tough, the happy, um, and, and I think I was glad that I had this perspective back then. Like if, if you look ahead 20 years or 30 years, um, you know, are you going to, when you look back on this moment, on this time in your life, on this particularly, you know, particular time you're going through, um, or competition or whatever it may be, is, are you going to be one of those people who said, well, I, I, yeah, you know, I, I was good. I could have done it, but you know, I just either didn't want to do it or I didn't or something happened, or are you going to be one of those people that, that can look back and say, I couldn't have, I couldn't have been any better than I was. I worked so hard that I was as good as I could be. And that's, that's what you want. Like I, I know I, like, even if I hadn't won gold, I know that I could look back today and said, you know, I worked as hard as I could work to be as good as I could be. And that's, that's really all that matters. That's really all any coach should ask of you. Um, because in the end, you know, there's generally usually one person on top of the podium or, or one Super Bowl winner, whatever you want to use as, as that example. But um, it's not, 
the win is not the only thing. Mm-hmm. And it's a fact it's not even the most important thing, contrary to what probably most people believe or certainly most coaches. Living life with no regrets. I um I exactly. I think I think that's beautiful. Um Dan, a couple more questions here and then we'll close this off. Um nineteen ninety four you win. Um culmination of all your hard work, all your heartbreak kind of come together in one moment. You win the gold medal. You're standing up on that stage. You have your your daughter Jane, who you named after your after your uh, your sister. Um, you're you're standing up there with her. You're kissing her. You know you're seemingly in that moment, kind of on top of the world. What what emotions were you going through in that in that exact moment? And all the things you just said. It's like um, they were all there, Sister Jane and. Uh, what she had been through and all that she had taught me. And then, you know, and then you get into the family and, um, and somehow, you know, my little, my little baby daughter named after her is there. And it was like a strange full circle moment. Um, and you know, the fact that it played out in front of the world is, it was just (laughs) surreal, like uh, almost, almost like it's, it was written, you know, but wasn't a true story. Um, but I just, you know, I just remembered being so grateful for, for all, you know, the, the people that were behind me, but also the, like I said, the people who were there always and hoping to celebrate with me (laughs) at these Olympics and it wasn't able to happen. And finally, finally they, you know, we could just get together that evening and, you know, deep breaths on everybody. It was it was really a great night. The um, after the race that night, and you know, with the family that were there, and uh, it was such a it was like the freest party, freest time ever, because everybody was just uh, like just <laughs> like that, you know. And um, I'm not sure any of us have had ever felt quite that free before. Did you um? Did you? I mean, hearing you kind of, you know, recollect on, on that time, did you feel like there was a lot of pressure on you to win, not only for your sister, but for your family and for the countless Americans who had learned about your story and, and were cheering you on and, and wanted to see you, you know, break through and, and do it? And if there was a lot of pressure, how how did you manage that? Um, you know, we mentioned a couple of coaches who might've been instrumental in, in your mindset and the psychology behind it, but how did you manage that pressure and, and, and be able to kind of fight against it? I mean, first of all, yeah, I did feel, I felt a lot of it, not, no, not put on by my family or any of that. They would never do that. They were, um, all about going out and doing your best and, but they knew, you know, they knew I was probably the best. And, and so, and it's not even, you know, the American people, all of that. Funny. It's not a pressure that you feel like, um, it's it's more of a pressure that you've, you want to pick them up some way. You want, you want them to feel good about it. And because I know, I mean, there was, like I've watched people on TV uh, that you really want to win or you want good things to happen and it doesn't. And you just, I mean, my heart aches for them. And so I knew that, that this was happening to a lot of people and I, I didn't want to be the person that was responsible for that. So it's not like I was thinking about that constantly, but it's, it's there. It's certainly there. And the press, I wasn't as worried about, I mean, they're going to say what they say. Um, but it was more just a, a feeling of really wanting good things for these people that wanted good things for me. And as far as how to get through it, I mean, look, I mean, that's, it's kind of what you dream about as an athlete. You, you want, you want to compete at the highest level and you want to compete under the highest pressure. Um, not necessarily this type and why it happened, you know, what, what it got to that point, but, it was what it was. There was nothing I could do to change that. And so I really just tried to 
you know, and I'm I'm not fooling anybody when you say, you know, go out and skate like it's any other race, because it wasn't. Um, but mindset can be, mindset was more, again, not focused on result, but he, the parts of the race that Pete and I talked about, you know, the, specifically, you know, from from 600, from basically 800 meters to 1,000 meters, because I knew I was going to be probably in the lead with a lap to go or even a half lap to go, but our, my weakness in that at the up to that point was the last half lap. So that's all Pete said to me. And before I went to the line, he skated up. He said, "Last two hundred, uh, meaning last half lap." And um, so I got there and tried to hold my technique together and get through the last turn. Dan, as you as you look back on your journey, um, as you look back on your relationship with speed skating and all that. All the glory and all the heartbreak that that it's brought you um, over the years. If you were to narrow it, I know this might be difficult, but if you were to narrow it down to one lesson that speed skating taught you about life, what would that one lesson be? I would probably say it's, I mean, maybe it goes with everything. Speed skating was... I was fortunate enough to have that vehicle to get me through life, but but it's not that. It's the people that I did it with and through. Um, literally last weekend, went to, uh, we do it every single year. We have a, a reunion of about 10 of us, all former skaters. Um, we get together every year, we ski, um, have a few beers, you know, just tell the same stories we've been telling for 40 years um so it's more it's more so um about the the relationships along the way than anything i mean i still am in touch thankfully with the competitors i skated against from other countries you know one of we lost one one of our major competitors uh, during covid uh from belarus but another one from formerly East Germany and now Germany, we, we're still in touch occasionally. And, and he was my chief competitor every time on the ice in the 500 meters. And, um, and those are the things that last, you know, it's ah, great. You know, I won gold, he won gold, but it's, we never talk about that. It's just other stuff and other, you know, family and life. And, um, so whatever it is, your sport is, or your occupation, uh, my, my, my greatest advice would be just to, you know, don't lose touch with, with those people that, that you live really important parts of your life with. So one more question, and then we have to close it out in uh, a manner that I usually do with, with every one of these episodes. But first, the question. Um, I came across this question the other day, and, and it got me thinking. And honestly, I don't even know if I know the answer to it. Um, would you rather have a one minute conversation with your past self or your future self? Hmm. No warning for this one at all. How about that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I still don't know if I, if I know the answer for my, I mean, I, okay, good. I'm still thinking about it. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say future self because I, I just want to know if, you know, if I live the rest of my life with the philosophy that I have now, I think, I think it'll go good, but I want to know from that person, if I did, you know, my past, I can kind of, I kind of know who I was and what I did. And I'm happy with it. Um, but boy, once you say that, I'd also kind of like to talk to my past self and and find out more things that I might've been thinking about, you know, gosh, I don't know. I guess I'll stick with my first answer, but that's a really good question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have I mean, a better. Answer. <laughs> no, I, I listen. I, like I said, I, I don't have an answer. So I, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. So I guess in talking to your future self, you would want to see, um, kind of if, if you, if you followed those certain life philosophies that you've had up to this point, kind of yeah. it played out the way that you imagine it will. Yeah, exactly. And if, you know, if there's 
grandkids along the way or whatever if they if they've been brought up that same way um yeah but it would be interesting to go back and talk as well to that that guy that went through all this that i tried to share the story today because you know i probably thought differently back then than i do now and even though i'm recalling what happened and how i felt you know maybe maybe i I would shed some light on my (laughs) on it as well i don't know but yeah great question all right, we're going to wrap this up, Dan, um, in a manner that we do with every episode, like I said, on the Victory Degree podcast. So every guest at the end of the episode, I ask them a piece of advice that they like to leave for the next guest, uh, not knowing who that next guest may be. So complete stranger. So the last guest that we had on the show uh, was Adam Brenneman. So Adam uh, was the number one tight end in the country at Penn State and at UMass, um, suffered a, a really terrible knee injury that basically ended his football career. He now does broadcasting for CBS. Uh, He has his own podcast, Next Up, with Adam Brenneman. Uh, Fantastic individual and a fantastic conversation. And his advice for you was just keep going. Keep going no matter what. Just keep going. And eventually you're going to get what you want. Eventually you're going to come out on the other side. Eventually you're going to achieve your goals if you just keep going and don't quit. So a lesson on consistency. First of all, what does that advice mean to you? And then what is the, the piece of advice that you'd like to leave for our next guest? I guess it means, you know, he, he pretty much hit my story on the, on the head if he didn't know who, I, who was coming on. I mean, more so I would say, nah, look, I don't want to change this advice. You don't always, your goals don't always come true, but if, if you keep going, there's always going to be positive that comes from that. Like it may not be the result you wanted, but you're going to get in the long run, a better result. Um, you know, it may take some time to learn what that is for me, for the next person. Um, or, uh, I guess along the same lines, I would say, uh, maybe I'll, I'll use what I kind of, what I used, um, in our talk today, I would say, I would say, try to um, put yourself 25, 30 years into the future and look back and, and ask yourself if, if you're being the best that you can be. Love it. What a way to end this episode. Dan, Perfect. thank you so much for your time. Um, like I said, really appreciative. I thought this was a fantastic conversation, and I'm I'm glad I get uh, you know I got to meet um, a little more of, of who Dan Jansen is. So thanks again for coming on, and wishing you all the yeah. best. Great, Nick. Thanks. I enjoyed it much. Take care. All the best to you. Thank you, sir. All right. Till next time.